good morning. I'm Jim Kleinwachter from the Conservation Foundation. We are the land trust that covers DuPage County, uh, Kendall, Will, and uh, Kane also, and we're being pulled into Grundy, LaSalle, DeKalb to the west. Our office is in Naperville on the McDonald farm. It's, it'll be the only farm left in uh, DuPage County at some point as uh, the farms get gobbled up. Ours is permanently protected with a conservation easement. You can see where the road would have come through the farm had it not been for the protection of this property. And we've implemented this old farm that dates back to the 1870s with all these what they call green infrastructure. So we have rain barrels and rainwater harvesting and uh, green roof and solar panels, wind turbines, all these green new technologies. The newest thing we added has been a drinking fountain that produces water from air. So it has solar panels that power the unit and there's a condensing uh, unit, chilling unit in there that uh, has the water that condenses on it and it captures that water and then has a little solar pump that can pump it out for drinking water. So it will make eight gallons of water a day. We have two of them there and it makes it just from the humidity in the air. So why I'm out working in communities is because a lot of people don't realize that if we want a nice Elmhurst, we have to work at it. And most of the land is private property. Look at the 95% private property. So working with private property, park districts, corporate sites, municipalities, and individual landowners is really what's going to make things a little bit better. And if I asked you, tell me about your childhood, what are your best memories? Many times it goes back to my grandpa had a farm in Wisconsin. We used to have a little cottage. Myself, I had, um, my mom and dad had a log cabin cottage up in northern Wisconsin. It didn't have running water. It had an outhouse. And you'd think like, oh my gosh, there were bats in the house and stuff like that. And uh -huh. it was the best. Um, so when you see what goes on, it, it isn't that you're being spoke to by a, a nature guy today. It is that we're all nature inside. We came from cavemen and Little House on the Prairie. My grandmother, just a couple generations back, she would point to a plane going across the sky and she'd say, they tell me that there's people in there and just couldn't get it through her head. They had a horse and buggy when she was a child. So you can see just go back a couple of generations and things were completely different than they are now. And we need to get back to that. That's where our roots are. That's where we came from. And in this book by Keller, he talks about how we're not going to be fulfilled. We're missing something in our lives if we're not connected to that uh, original environment. And uh, here I'm standing on the Appalachian Trail, and I guided my son to his first big muskie. Uh, when we see things, this is my daughter dancing in the Mediterranean at 2 o'clock in the morning, my son and his best friend. Um, we, we see things. We're gardeners. We like to be outside. You like to go to the park district or you like to go to the forest preserves or think about your vacations. Uh, I went to Mexico and swam with whale sharks or people go to the Rocky Mountains or they just go to Minnesota or, you know, where we pay to go away, we leave the city and we go to parks and the only place I can think of that you might go to would be Las Vegas, that you didn't go there for the natural beauty of the area. So every place else, we think about the vacations that we take and where we spend our money and how we spend our leisure time. It all goes back to be, we want to be part of nature. So how do we bring that to people? And I started doing it with the Conservation at Home program to say, okay, you might realize that, I, okay, I do love nature, but... How much time do I spend there? How many days do you get to go to the Forest Preserve? When's the last time you were at the Morton Arboretum or um, the Chicago Botanic Garden? And can we bring a little piece of that home so that we can see it on a more frequent basis? So I go to people's homes and help them implement some of these things that I'm going to talk about today. And if I start with the simple things, that it isn't that difficult, I put up a list here. And 
I think we can all agree that there are things that we can do that are gentle steps that aren't, I'm ask, not asking you to rototill your front yard and start over again. These are just simple things that we all can do that um, would just be a further step. So it doesn't matter where you are in your, your journey, there's always things that we can do more. And when I found starting working for the Conservation Foundation, I'm a sales and marketing guy, and we just don't do that well. We've been around for 50 years, and we, we do all these wonderful things, but very few people know about us and know that we actually, I designed this program to help that missing gap. So people would come up to me and they'd say, well, it sounds great, but I don't know where to start. I wouldn't know where to go. I have all shade in my yard, or I have a wet yard, or I have this problem and that problem. And it's overcoming those obstacles. And I found that the best way is to give you personal advice. If it means coming to your yard, I go to your yard. So um, in this uh, quote by Bromfeld, he talks about the, the war that's being waged against nature. And we all know that, uh, you know, nobody ever stands up at my presentations and says, oh, that's crazy talk. You know, we see it everywhere. They're paving over a prairie and they're putting up a new Walmart or whatever the case may be. We can see it everywhere. And it's in the paper that last week it was a, a cougar got hit on Route 88 out by Aurora. And, you know, the clash between um, civilization and nature is an ongoing thing and nature usually loses. So where we start, I teach at COD and I started teaching there because the students were coming to me and saying, we're being taught that plants are plants. And so I went to COD and I said, are you actually teaching them that it doesn't make plants are the same? Well, yeah, plants are plants. And I said, no, I mean, you teach them the difference between annual, which isn't gonna come back and a perennial. Why would you not teach them that some plants have more benefit than others? And I get this strange look and they say, well, you wanna teach a class like that? And I said, if I have to, I will. Um, but once we understand that plants are the lifeblood of this universe, we, we don't understand that without plants, we have nothing. We have no water, we have no air. And the fact that plants were here the beginning thing, the beginning life was plant forms. And once we had the plant forms, they're creating oxygen, they're, all these good things are happening. Eventually, other life forms evolved, and on we go. So thinking that plants are just cute things I put in my yard, it's not enough force there. They are the life force of this planet. So once we understand, okay, I get it. They're the bottom of the food chain. Everything eats plants. Then we take the next step is it makes a difference what plants we choose. This hummingbird, when they come back from being gone all winter, they're going to be looking across the landscape for something they can use. So they don't come for conversation. They don't come for a cup of coffee. They're looking for food. And they scan your landscape very quickly and say, nothing here for me. So if you don't have hummingbirds, it's because we have not planted for them. And we've destroyed what was in the, I mean, the prairie covered in Elmhurst and woodlands. So what was there isn't there anymore, and we've replaced it with other things. And it might be inhospitable to some of the things that we want to have. So thinking that we have the power to do whatever we want to do. And when you talk about evolution, in the animal world, we understand it, that a turtle has a shell that can carry itself around to protect the turtle. We understand a cheetah can run fast to catch the gazelle. We understand that a giraffe has that goofy long neck, but there's a reason. It eats the acacia leaves that are way up in the air. But we don't see evolution on plants. So in this regard, when they say plants are plants, yeah, they look the same to me. If I have two potted plants here, they look the same. What's the difference? Well, some have evolved in the Chicagoland area to survive. And it's in the root systems. You look at many times these native plants are going deeper than an oak tree. And they're opening up the soil to allow water percolation. They're increasing the organic capacity of the soil. So the rich soil we have, the Midwest is loaded with this black topsoil that we see. 
that didn't come from a glacier. That came from these plants. So every year they cast off about 25% of their root mass and it increases the soil capacity. So the richest farmland we ever had in the United States was from prairie land. And the plants don't get credit for creating this wonderful soil. So that is going on. If you have poor soil, you can repair it using some of these plants. And the plants are used to growing in poor soil. So it isn't like you'd have to bring all these amendments in and food and so on. They're used to growing in rock and wet and you name it. There are proper plants for it. And right now, you've invested in, in your community. You live here, you work here, your grandkids are here. There's reasons why you're living in Illinois right now. And why can't we embrace the plants from Illinois? If you were living in Arizona, you'd be talking about cactus. I'm helping my sister in California. They're, they pay the people to get rid of their grass, but then they say, after that, you can do anything you want. People are putting down astroturf, which is plastic, or they put down rocks in their, what was their grass yards, uh, the wrong thing. And so embracing the plants of that climate that you chose to live in is the way to go. So my sales side shows, well, you know, I'll show you the pretty stuff and I'll show you how it's implemented. And then you take a choice. Um, you know, we see it with other things, you know, we don't want to be buying all these things from all over the world when we can make our own products here. It's the same way with the plants. We have our own plants that do very, very well here. And if we think of the other plants as decorative, so there's two ways of looking at a plant. It's either decorative, like a rose, or it's functional where there are pollinators using it and birds are feeding from it and it's uh, increasing the soil capacity and doing all these positive things. So it's okay to have decorative things. In the house, we first start with our functional things. We bring in the microwave, the stove, the refrigerator, the couch, the TV, the bed, those things we need. And then we decorate afterward. You put some little flowers on the wall or, or on the shelf, or you put some um, pictures on the wall. Those are all decorative things around the function. And if we thought about that in our landscape, creating function, and usable and then decorate around that with these decorative plants. Um, I'll show you later how that lines up with what we've been doing. So I don't expect you to take out your whole front lawn, but people are doing it. This is right in Glen Ellen. And that orange is milkweed. So we typically think of milkweed as the four foot common milkweed. And that's not the only milkweed that we can use. So we can implement these things. Monarchs are now on the endangered species list. And something simple as that orange flower could be part of the answer. We do this across the region. So we now have eight organizations running the program that I started. And we're into Wisconsin, we're into Michigan, all the way down to St. Louis. There's uh, over 4,000 dots on the map. The bright red ones are mine and the other sister organizations are in the other colors. So it wouldn't matter if you're in Cook, Lake, McHenry, wherever, we're able to help and facilitate this action going on. We also have a sister program for non-residential sites. So we've done the um, Elmer's Hospital, for example, a bunch of hospitals and nature centers and corporate sites, you name it, this non-residential side can do help with libraries and any site that you have could be better. Uh, in Elmhurst, I worked on the area on the prairie path, along the prairie path, cutting invasive species out and working with the park district on some of those sites that they have. This is one in Naperville. Park districts are a big one we work with. A lot of the land is not applicable to ball fields. So many of us are not playing ball anymore anyway. So we're walking the dog or we're pushing grandkids in a stroller and having areas like this. I saw a mink swim across this creek when I was walking on the bridge and seeing how these areas that were uh, good for passive rec recreation, not the active recreation style, can be improved with habitat improvement. This was a ditch and it was just mud and they tried to mow down in it and the tractor got stuck and 
We're now calling this a bioswale. Sounds much better than ditch. And it creates habitat. And you can imagine the baby bunny is going to scurry in there when the mower's coming. There's milkweed for the monarchs. All kinds of things happen. And the area like that, it was not going to be ever used for a ball field. So why aren't we taking this out of mowing? And I'll get into grass later on. But some of these problems can be solved. This was an area between a sidewalk and the curb. And it was on a fire station. And they said, well, nothing will grow there. We've tried everything. Well, it's not that nothing will grow there. That's the wrong thing. It's a very inhospitable place. And it has issues with salt, with snow plows, with people trampling, and extremely dry because it's up on a raised curb. Not a very good place to pick, to choose to try to grow plants, but there are plants that do very well. That's um, that Sparabolus is prairie drop seed, and it can grow extremely well in a very dry location. It doesn't mind salt. And it actually, it, one of the cool things about that plant is it can tear apart the carbon atoms so it can eat gasoline. They use it on gas stations where they have runoff because it can tear apart the gasoline carbon atoms and it eats them. So it can remitter, uh, uh, what's the word I'm going to say, uh, remediate soil. And some of these plants are doing that with water and air. So my granddaughter and my son were strolling through downtown Chicago and they found a common milkweed that was not planted but had found its way into this planting area and they found a little caterpillar on the milkweed. And after that, I got them some milkweed for their own place and got them some caterpillars that they watched. She named them banana, cocoa, and super. Mm -hmm. So these three little caterpillars and my daughter-in-law, who's an engineer, very smart woman, just, she was blown away by wait a minute, that tiny little egg, one of them was a white speck on the leaf. The tiny egg turned into a caterpillar. The caterpillar, she said, you're telling me this green and white and black striped caterpillar is going to turn orange. Yep. How does it, where does it make orange? And I said, this is the magic. And so um, they watched it and she had to explain to my granddaughter that even though Coco is hanging upside down in this J, he's not dead. Well, he looks dead. He's not moving. And then when he emerged, that's not Coco. I know what Coco looks like. And um, this whole story. So it, it was as much of an eye-opening thing to my daughter-in-law. And she said, we have to be part of this. We need, to, we need to plant more in our own yard. So how do you reach people? And, and my answer is one by one have them experience something that's mind-blowing. She spends her day caring for the children. And when she thought of this mother laid an egg and then left and never came back, that poor child, you know, and it needs no nurturing. And so you, but she, you run through the normal things. Well, when a chicken has a, hatches an egg, they take care of the baby. Ducks do and most animals have some motherly care, and this is one that doesn't need anything. It's an amazing story, and Coco had to fly to Mexico, and they were like, Coco can't fly to Mexico. Look at her. I'm like, well, she's got to go or, or die trying. So some of these things, um, and I used to own a hardware store, so my background is in helping people and solving problems. And all I did was when I changed careers was – new set of problems and new set of uh, people that don't understand. So almost every site they go to when they, when you look at it, there are issues, things that are not working properly. And if we can fix some of those, then um, we make some positive inroads. One of the ladies I went to, she says, come in the back and see where the lake is. Well, when I went back there, there was no lake. And she goes, well, in May, it's, it's under, you know, six inches of water. And I said, well, and then July, it's rock-hard clay. So you can see the varying between times of the month. This is very poor soil. All the topsoil is gone. You have compacted clay. 
difficult situation. I can understand why she can't grow grass there. And grass was never intended to be in those areas. And that soil is, is not very good for most plants. The native plants don't care. And they will fix that soil over a period of time. And we started promoting the compost bins because of that organic material. You know, right now, all the leaves are falling. The leaves are the food for the trees. And yet we're raking them, we're bagging them, we're hauling them to the curb. We're doing the wrong things when we should be utilizing all that rich organic material and putting it back in the soil so we don't have the compacted clay anymore. That compacted clay is screaming out it's short of organics. And then we have organic material even in the kitchen with all of the clippings from carrots and so on, and we're not utilizing those organic materials that we already have. So when I'm selling things, it's easy for me to sell birds. Very few times people come to me and say, can you help me bring more skunks to my yard or more bees or more uh, snakes? No, they want birds, they want butterflies. With the birds, the top right and bottom left are both invasive species. They're both from Europe, they don't belong here. They're overpopulating. 50% of the bird count was in these four. The other two are native, but they've adapted too well to suburbia and they've overpopulated in the area and cause a tremendous amount of difficulty. What you really want are these. How pretty and colorful are the native birds? And this grouping I purposely picked out because they will come to a bird feeder. They like occasional snack but that's not a solid food source for them. So in the winter time when they, this, a lot of these grouping, these birds will stay, some of them will, and they like a little seed snack in the summer um, or fall, winter. But again, thinking that what is the sustainable food source, every bird eats bugs. And the bugs are on these plants that are from Illinois. So if we understand that every bird eats bugs for a living. Even the hummingbird, we put out the hummingbird feeder, it's sugar water, literally sugar water. And that's like me drinking a Pepsi. It gives me a little boost, but it's not sustainable. I cannot live off sugar water. They cannot live off sugar water. They eat ants and nectar, uh, which again is more like sugar. So they get their protein. All of the birds get the protein from bugs. The bugs are on the plants. So even though they will switch to seeds, they like seeds too, they need the bugs. Most of the birds are flying away because we don't have bugs in the summer, or only have bugs in the summer. These ones will never come to your bird feeder because they're eating bugs, 100% bugs on some of those. Some of them will switch off. The Oriole, Tanager, some of those will switch back to berries later in the summer to supplement the bugs that they're eating. Some of them are just strictly bug. We don't even think about a robin. Robin will never come to your bird feeder. I don't even put them on here because they're so ordinary that people don't think about them, but they get their own food eating worms in your yard. But kind of thinking about that, um, and many of these birds cannot feed on bugs in grass. There's just nothing there for them. Grasses, I'll talk about it in a minute, but um, we can grow things that produce seeds if you want the seeds. We don't have to always think of seeds as something I buy and bring them home and put them in a container. There are the plants that, that produce those seeds that can be planted directly. And so the other thing besides the birds, everybody loves the, the butterflies. We hear a lot about the monarchs. They're just the poster child for all of nature that's suffering. And so it isn't that this poor monarch is the only thing. If you looked at most bird species, most snake species, most other species other than humans, they're all diminished from what they were because of habitat loss. And if you looked at where they came from, all you have to do is Google any plant that you're interested in. Where did it come from? And if it's from somewhere else, it's not functioning here. There's nothing wrong with some of these, like lilacs, very nice smell but you never see a bee on a lilac bush. You never see them on a rose bush. You don't see them functioning in the ecosystem. So if the bugs aren't on the plant, 
there's no birds that are feeding off of bugs on a lilac because the lilac doesn't have any bugs on it. Um, some of the bugs that we have that are on rose bushes, for example, aphids and some of those things, um, they pile up on certain plants because they're not from here and there aren't birds utilizing them. So you don't get many bugs, overpopulation of bugs on these native plants because there's birds there are eating them off. So again, the system is functioning with some of the plants and it's not in some of them. Long we recognize that, I'm, I don't scold anybody for having these non-native plants, but this is what the developers are putting in the landscapes. This is probably what you have a basis of, or when you bought your house, this is what was there. And the list could go on. But I show people and walk around sites, and this was one downtown Naperville, and they show me a site like this and say, well, could we do something there? I put my hands together and say, like, this is Death Valley. I mean, you couldn't do worse. So if you transform these things and you tell them, you know, I think I can make this better, and then boom, uh, we got a, a company that donated the walkway. We want people in there. I don't want them just to stay around the edge. I want to smell it and feel it and hear the buzzing and, and all of these things that can happen when it's done properly. What would you do on a residential site? So these people came and they said, well, we don't have any birds or butterflies. I've got problems with water. The downspout pours out the water. It runs down on the sidewalk. In the summertime, we have wet shoes. In the wintertime, it turns to ice. We have to put salt on it to get rid of the ice. The salt kills the grass and we have problems. Look at the old overgrown arborvita that were, was cut away and Look at the beautiful stonework that some artist cut every piece and set them in that house. So it's beautiful stonework that now is shown again. We reduced the landscape that was higher than the sidewalk. So water will run to the lowest point. The sidewalk was low, and so the water ran on the sidewalk. Now we reduce it. We give the water a place to go, plant plants in there that will absorb. We still have a little bit of grass, but it's got a defined edge. So it's got its place over there. And I think this is a win-win situation where we've created some habitat, we've made it look better, and you still have curb appeal and you still have some function. So same thing, you go to the park or homeowners association, and I don't wanna put a blanket down there and have a picnic with my daughter. I know it's covered with goose poop, there isn't any um, weeds in there, so you know it's been sprayed with some chemicals. And it isn't a good place to fish. You look at that shoreline, you've got eroded shoreline, you've got all kinds of problems that we see in these areas. And if it's a creek area, you see the erosion even worse. And uh, that trail is gonna be impacted at some point. And the answer is going back the way it was. I have to be able to sell those homeowners that this is a better situation. They will not, will not have geese. So geese are terrified of the prairie plants. They, their biggest predator is a fox or a coyote or a dog, and they can't see them there. And they're fat and lazy, and they, they can't run away very quickly, so they need a distance. They need to see on that grass long way away so they can see that predator coming. So you've eliminated the geese. You've the birds are still there. You're going to have finches eating in the, in the area. You'll have a heron or um, an egret in the water eating frogs. The habitat's there for crayfish. Much better place to fish is in the weed beds like that. But can I sell that is the question, and I'm working at it every day. Grass is another thing. I used to sell fertilizer, and you look at that bag of grass seed or fertilizer from Scott's, 32 is nitrogen, so it's nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, and heavy nitrogen. That makes the blade grow grass quickly and not healthy. It's way overloaded, and in most things in life, we're looking for balance, and it's the same way with this. If you had a more balanced fertilizer, a 10-10-10 or something like that, it'd be much better with the lower nitrogen Nitrogen is running off in many cases into our rivers and streams. So you just bought a bag of runoff and blade growing 
and that's not really not what you want. You want healthy grass. You don't want it to grow faster as you have to mow twice as often. So we're doing the wrong things. We're killing the things in the grass that can provide some pollinator value. So if we are going to have grass, I went to one house and the husband and wife came out and they were on polar opposites and she's saying, haven't you seen the no mow May? He wants to mow. You know, tell us. Put me right in the middle there. And I, I looked at him and I said, mow it. And she goes, oh, what do you, you know? And I said, look at the grass. There's nothing in it. They've, you've, you know, had Chemlon or some company come. It's been sprayed. There's just nothing there but grass. You might as well mow it. It has zero value. So unless you let the clo clover grow, the grass part is not going to be. So I think the whole no mow may is not bringing the education that we want. It's not about the mowing. It's about creating habitat. And so you could have habitat in your beds. There's, bees love um, Virginia bluebells and violets and a bunch of different things that we could grow. If your beds were full, then it wouldn't really matter what you did with your grass or just reduce the amount of grass. But um, again, we're doing the wrong thing. We're covering the United States with grass. So you look at this chart, dark green is where the states are covered with grass as the major surface. So in Illinois, there's more grass than corn and soybeans together, zero value to wildlife. And it costs us millions of dollars to cut it and mow it and feed it. It's from Europe. It, the uh, credit is given to Thomas Jefferson. He brought it over at Monticello. And the idea was it's a rich man's surface. And so on his little kingdom, he could have all this grass and it, it's a sign of wealth. So from there, we all want a little piece of that action. So we all feel rich, but we don't think of grass as a rich man's surface anymore. But when you look at the $40 billion we spent on grass care, and it is not sustained, and next year it's going to be, a, you know, with inflation, it'll be more. So zero wildlife value. I'm not saying we don't need grass, Wrigley Field and so on, and places around uh, buildings like this, but we don't need as much as we have. Those states that we're looking at that, um, that don't have grass right now are sparsely populated or mountainous or desert. And as we move there and people populate things, it'll probably flip in those states too, unless we change something. So if I show you a picture, left or right, which one's prettier? Which one would be filled with insects and one side is devoid of anything? One side is burnt in the hot drought. One is in the full bloom during the drought. So these plants have captured the water from April and May and they use that water captured to bloom in July and August during the drought. So it's, to me, polar opposites. When I saw this, I walked down this path and I thought, you can't make any more night and day. So yes, I'm selling concepts. Doesn't look like this today, but you see the idea of, and which area have we chose to put most of our yards in and most of the park areas that we live in. Um, and does that make a lot of sense? Same thing with trees. So we're talking to communities about there are differences in trees. It's not just a tree is a tree. You can classify, Doug Tallamy's book will classify every tree from best to worst. You can list them. Oak trees are number one in our region for value to the environment. Their longevity, they live up to 400 years and they feed 500 or more insects and a variety of other mammals and um, things in the, in the trees. The wood is very useful for furniture and flooring. There's a lot of value in an oak tree. So you can classify these trees. And some of them, like um, maple and honey locust, are overpopulated. We've planted way too many. We didn't learn from the ash. So uh, before that, it was elm that were overplanted. We're not learning. There is another uh, longhorn Asian beetle that eats maples. So something to worry about when we're overplanting these things. So we're not saying maple's a bad tree. We're saying we have some, in most communities, I can almost guarantee you have at least 30% maple. And the tree 
the Morton Arboretum, for example, would tell you 10% is good, 15% max, and we're double that. So um, Bradford pear or the uh, calorie pear trees have been overplanted, and they're now escaping and becoming problems, and they'll be on the invasive species list just as soon as it's an economic thing right now where the developers have purchased trees and they're in the system and growing in nurseries and they've got to stop that and start growing other trees to before they can list them as invasive species but we know that they're um, not good trees and um, we shouldn't be doing that and then well, the trees that we have i went to this yard and they're saying we bought this house because of the oak trees and I had to tell them that the worst thing you could do would be to mow around your oak trees. Trees and grass don't go together. Never have. If you went to any forest preserve or something, when you get back in the woods, there's no grass. But we insist on putting the grass and both the mowers running around on it and the fact that we can't, all those leaves that fall that are supposed to enrich the soil, we can't have those leaves on our precious grass. So we have to mow the grass and mow the leaves and rake the leaves. And I found little trillium and different wildflowers popping up these oak trees. The one right there, for example, is probably 125, 150 years old, far before the house was there. And this was a woods. So they plunked the house in the woods and then not understanding that you bought the house because you love the woods why aren't we keeping the woods as woods? So in a, in a normal woodland thing, there would be ferns growing and there would be shrubs and there would be a variety of trees like small red buds and um, a different canopy size instead of here you've got grass and then this 200 foot tree and there's nothing in between there. So a bunch of those birds would nest in you know, cardinals nest about eight feet off the ground. Well, there's no place for a cardinal to nest there, for example. So I show them, you know, if you didn't have the grass, you'd be looking at Virginia bluebells in the right picture. That's woodland flocks. There's wild geranium. There's sedges that look like grass, but they don't inhibit the transfer of water. So many times you see your tree roots coming up in the grass. It's telling you that the tree can't breathe well and it's not getting the water that it wants. So grass is like a tarp, and it does not allow water and air transfer very well. So it's suffering. It doesn't kill the tree, but it definitely weakens it and makes shortens its life, perhaps. And if you had some of the plants that would typically be in your wooded areas as, you know, why fight to try to grow grass where it doesn't grow anyway? All of the pollution we have in the rivers and streams now is coming from runoff. It used to be that there was a pipe full of chemicals coming through bringing the pollution. That's not happening anymore. We've cleaned that up. And so it's surface runoff. We're getting uh, the nitrogen from the lawns. We're getting uh, salt from the streets and motor oil. And all of it's being carried in the water system. So if we understand where the water is moving across our property, we can kind of figure out what it's carrying. and one ends up being um, dumped into the river systems. There's easy ways for us to try to catch that with either rain barrels or rain gardens, using those bioswales kind of situation to absorb that water instead of run it off. I work with DuPage County. I saw the um, charts in there. Um, DuPage County stormwater actually pays some of my salary to go around and tell people that we don't want it pushing it into the storm system. So the storm systems are full. Every community I go to, whether it be Lombard, Glen Ellen, you name it, during a heavy rain, the storm system can't handle it. And so we're having flooding issues. And if everybody was to deal with their own water on their own property as much as they could, that would help with the situation. Um, many times it's some drain head like this that doesn't look so bad and you say well that's not so bad i don't live anywhere near the river i'm not adding to it well these drain systems are all connected in this picture what we're doing is we're taking your house is almost always pitched up high and the ground is 
pulling away. These drain heads are always low. And we're putting plantings around the drain head that are going to catch some of that water and keep it out of the drain head. So anything we do is going to improve. So if this was to catch 40% of the rainwater, then we're 40% better than we were. So um, this isn't the problem. People say, well, you know, it's not my fault. I, put the, I didn't put the drain there. But it's the other side of the pipe that we have to look at. And usually we're separated from that. That's not in our yard. I don't see it. But if you look at the um, statistics of what's in the river, you can see high nitrogen levels, high phosphorus levels, um, driveway coating. So the blacktop stuff that we put on our driveways, coal tar emulsion, um, we put it on the driveway and then it kind of goes away somewhere and then next year we put it on again. Well, it doesn't go away somewhere. What It gets scraped off with the snow plows and ends up on the grass and the grass ends up washing it into the river systems. It's measurable now and causing diminished fish values. So things like that that happen, and that's what I do with the Conservation Home Program to, to tell people um, that you can help. There can be even incremental things that you can do better, and it's not that difficult. And, you know, one of the presentations I was doing, you hear this all the time. That somebody says, well, it was the least I could do. And I laughed thinking, well, I'm trying to do the most I can do. And I can help you. I have brochures. So I took uh, the, the big native plant guide is Swink and Wilhelm's Guide to the Plant of Chicago Region. It's about this thick. And I guarantee you 15 seconds of paging through this, you're going, I can't do this. It has all this detailed information, not user-friendly. I made a user-friendly one, um, native plants for dummies, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um, I sectioned the things out by height. So if you want a short thing for the front sidewalk, I need a tall thing to hide the big back fence. Um, little icons in there that show birds like me, butterflies like me, I like water, things like that that are simple. And then all of the brochures on the back, it says, when in trouble, call Jim. So my information is on that material. And I will come to your house if necessary. Some people call and say, well, I bought a, a subdivision house and I've got nothing but grass. I probably don't need to see your grass. But somebody else calls and they said, well, I've got a creek running through my yard and I've got erosion issues and I got some trees, I don't know what they are. Okay, that, that needs personal help. So that's what I found is that people really want to do something better. They, they're stuck and don't know how. And we bridge that gap with our Conservation at Home program. So I can take some questions, um, comments, anything? Yes. Okay, instead of grass, there's a variety of things. If it was sunny, then you'd go back to the prairie. Um, we're using a term now, I created this meadow. So the prairie, if you go to, you go to Fermi or you go to some of these forest reserves that are wide expanses, the prairie can be quite tall and messy. And, um, you know, when I, when I did some plantings at Elmer's College, for example, we keep the profile lower. So we're using the term meadow as a shorter, more flower-filled area that's going to be more acceptable than what the wild prairie was. We had tall grass prairies across this part of the United States, and that's not appropriate for, you know, we don't have buffalo anymore. So let's tone it down, let's put these plants in. So the, you begin with the, the most popular, easy to grow things, coneflowers, black-eyed Susans, um, blazing star, some of those pretty ones that I showed grow very easily. You're gonna bring birds and butterflies and you start there. Well, if, if nobody has any other questions, I'll be here and, oh, okay. Okay, the question was, uh, what do you do about fertilizer? Um, tone it down so you don't buy the 32 high nitrogen one. 
There are organic ones that you could look at, like Ringer Lawn Restore. There's Melorganite. There's a bunch of ones that would be lower um, nitrogen formulas. And um, you don't need to do it as often. We're not um, real short of nitrogen here. We get a lot uh, of rainwater that's very good for the soils. So you don't need as much. You can do soil testing. So if you're questioning your soil, you can have a soil test and it'll tell you what's going on in your yard. Some of the times it's, it's compacted clay. You can add things like gypsum that helps break up the clay. You can do things like um, core aeration, which opens up the soil a little bit. Then you can add your soil amendments at that time. Compost, spread compost. You can put compost up to a half inch thick on the lawn. And if you do like in, a, in conjunction with core aeration, it gets into the soil deeper. And then I would compost every living thing I could possibly get and turn it back into the soil any way that you can because this, that's what the soil depletion is here, organics. Yes? Shaded areas, I'd go back to those um, pictures a couple back. Um, so that's a good example. There's um, some of the tall stuff that's Solomon Seal, wild geranium. A lot of the plants that we have, you think of a geranium, and in our mind, that's that red thing that we have in a pot on the patio. But the wild geranium, the native, is a perennial plant that comes back year after year. You're looking at it in the bottom right-hand corner. It's not blooming right now, but they have beautiful pink flower, and it can spread across the woodlands. The purple back there is woodland phlox. So again, you think of phlox as either the little carpet phlox. Um, there's a woodland phlox. The green is, uh, those are sedges, very useful pieces. And you can see the gap in between. So there is places for air and water transfer in those. It's not a, uh, a sod carpet in those wooded areas. So. Bluebells in the springtime, they're similar to a tulip, which we know the tulips and daffodils came from Holland. Nothing wrong with them. However, we have a native, um, they call these ephemeral, where they come up and they do their blooming thing and then they all fall back. So in this planting you see on the right, that looks like it's all bluebells. They'll all fall back. The ferns will come up later. The sedges pop later. So you have looks like nothing else is in there right now but more will come later after the the ephemerals drop yes Where would you find some of those? The um there are some of the nurseries will have them i put in my chart i put the botanic name and the common name and i would suggest if you go to your retailer and say, this is what I want. This is Asclepius tuberosa, butterfly milkweed, that orange one. Can you get this? And if they say, no, I can't get that, then you go elsewhere. But um, we have, there are certain places I can tell you that absolutely have them. We have plant sales, DuPage County has plant sales, Forest Preserve in, in May. But with our conservation at home program, we have access to the plants all year round. I've got people trading plants. It's kind of like a club. If you thought of the Conservation at Home program as like a club, you can join the club even if you're not ready to get a sign for your yard. There's a bunch of signs, by the way, in Elmhurst, probably dozens. Um, but if you haven't earned your sign yet, you can still be part of the club. It says, I'm trying, and that's okay. Um, there's a lady right in Elmhurst that she was one of the ones I made the, the uh, program for. They would send me out to people. Somebody called in and said, can you help me with my yard? They send me out. We didn't have anything. So I went through her yard. She's right off of St. Charles. And stunning yard. Not a weed in it. Just flowers everywhere. Just beautiful. Um, Jane Fausler. So she's a longtime um, resident of Elmhurst. And... I had to leave there saying, beautiful yard, sorry, can't help you. Um, and that happened a couple more times, and I was like, okay, 
we can't, we have to recognize the work and the efforts people have put in in the right way. And um, so with this club, you can, people are exchanging plants. We have a Facebook site that people are showing pictures of these rare birds that pop in their yard or they're giving away. I've got cone flowers that are growing. Anybody want them? Those kinds of things. So we um, network with people doing their, the right thing. So um, certainly I can guide you to where you could get whatever plants that you wanted. Well, thank you. And I will be here. There's materials on the side. Anything else I can help with, uh, get my information, email me. Um, I'm more than ha happy to help. Thank you.